Well, good morning. <laughs> wow, there, there are people in the chairs. <laughs> Anyone here watch online? Be honest. All right, so you people are important to me. No, you're all important to me. Uh, it's very challenging to preach to a camera in the back, so please forgive me if I sometimes default and start staring at Jurgen in the back. I have to remind myself, hi, Jurgen. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you all here this morning. I think it's uh, appropriate that we begin our, our meetings again uh, with the Lord's table. And so before we start, if, if you're a visitor here or a guest, not a member of Glenridge Bible Church, but you have a personal relationship, a personal conviction, a personal trust in Christ Jesus as your Lord, uh, you are welcome here, and you are welcome to participate. This is the Lord's table. Christ himself has invited us and really commanded us to come together to remember him. We remember early on in the life of the church. It was one of the main four main facets of church life, fellowship, the apostles' doctrine, prayer, and the Lord's table. It's important because we are forgetful people, aren't we? Does, would you agree? that we're very forgetful. I can't even remember where I put my keys sometimes, let alone my own salvation that Christ purchased for me. So it's a very precious time to be here this morning together. Before we start, just a quick announcement that when you come up to, to receive the emblems, when you come up to receive the bread and the, and the grape juice, which represents the wine, of course, uh, the bread is in a cup underneath the grape juice. So don't be confused. I see you laughing, Bob, because I'm sure you were a victim of that at one time. But they're all in that single serving. So the bread is in a cup underneath the wine. So don't, don't fall victim to that little trick of ours, I guess. It's just for, for expediency so that you can get both things, both emblems at once. And of course, when you come to the table in a few moments, please respect each other's social distance we want to be in compliance with the bylaws. Uh, we don't want to bring any conflict into the church. Uh, there's no need for that. Uh, and some of you are probably wondering and have asked me, when, when will we sort of take a stand? And I've told you very clearly when they come into this building and tell me I can no longer preach the word of God, that's where we will take our stand. But for now, if I have to remain six feet away from you, I'm good with that. I'm okay with that. So let's open in our Bibles, if you have them, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we see there that Paul writes to the church in Corinth, a, a church that was going through a difficult time and struggling and understanding the faith and the function and the life of church. It says, For I received from the Lord, in verse 23 of chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. We remember this, of course, as the Passover meal. And following the Passover meal, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. It is a picture of the body of Jesus Christ. It's for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, the cup and the bread are symbols, they're pictures. They remind us of the great cost of our salvation. That Jesus Christ would lay down his life on the altar of Calvary for our salvation. And so that is what we remember this morning. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And that's the gospel message that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners like us, to lay down his life for sinners like us. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood of the body and the blood of the Lord. And now our responsibility, beloved, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Could I have the elders please come to their tables? And 
I would ask you at this time to please proceed to the table closest to you and receive the emblems. And then return to your seats and wait for further instruction. Thank you. Apostle John records, and he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, and where they crucified. Two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center, fulfilling Isaiah 53 and 12. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Our Father in heaven, we are again so humbled that the divine Son would come and take our place in the center cross and there endure the shame and humiliation and that he would take upon himself the sin of the world, the sin of his people, and there would give, his, give himself as our Passover lamb we give you thanks for this incredible gift that Jesus Christ, holy and divine, separate from sinners, would die in our place. Jesus truly is the King of kings. And so as we remember his broken body upon the cross without one bone being broken, we give you thanks for this bread which reminds us of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat.
John goes on to write after this. Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, the scripture might be fulfilled, said I thirst. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put on a hyssop and put it to his mouth. And so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Our loving Father, again, our only merit is in the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So we give you thanks now this morning that we're able to come into your holy presence in the name of Jesus to worship you and to thank you and to remember the great cost of our salvation, the height, the depth, the width of your love. We thank you again for this love feast and for this cup which reminds us of the shed blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you, ask you to bless it, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white, sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Our Father, our God, we thank you again for the great hope of the resurrection. That as Jesus paid the penalty for sinners, the offering was accepted a soothing aroma rising up like the incense of the Old Testament into the highest places of glory in your kingdom. And you accepted that offering of Jesus Christ once and for all and settled forever our salvation in him. We thank you for this gift. And as we remember, we worship you as the author and finisher and captain of our faith. We thank you, Lord Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. It's good to have you here, isn't it? Good. Someone asked me recently, as we shift gears now to our our meeting this morning, Bobby, when's the church opening? I understand the question. When's the church opening? I said I didn't realize it was closed. I said, well, of course we you know we we can't have services and we can't have our regular meetings and. And, and, and Bible study, and, and, and like there's no normalcy to what we're doing. So, yeah, so when's, when's the church, church opening? And I said, well, we may have altered things slightly. Things may look a little different, but to the apostles, things would look very different to them today. I said, the church is never closed. It opened 2,000 years ago, in a sense, when Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and it will never close. 
It's never closed. The building might be closed. But I gently remind you in love, as I have to remind myself quite often, take a look in the mirror and look around and see your brethren. We are the church. And no government mandate, no virus, no law of man will alter that truth. The church is not closed. It's open and will always be. So having said that, let's praise God this morning. Because we have this opportunity to be here in person and to look each other in the eye as opposed to over Zoom or over social media. Or on YouTube. Boy, YouTube puts on 10 pounds, I've noticed. Well, that might be me, I don't know. But it's so good to see and fellowship together. So let's take a minute, if you're able to, stand up. If you're able to, stand up. Look around. Gaze upon your brethren. Give them a wave. Maybe there's somebody you haven't seen in a while. We can't shake hands right now. Look around and wave. And let's thank God. Loving Father, we thank you. We thank you that the church is not closed. It is open. It is always open. It is eternal. The majority of the church is in glory now. And we are here in your holy presence to worship you, to thank you, to praise you, to think upon your Son, to remember upon your Son, to grow in Christ-likeness, to grow in holiness, to, to, grow, in, to grow in sanctification. To, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. We praise you that, that history is not being written by men, but in fact, history is being written by you, Lord. So we give you thanks that you are in control. Despite what's happening around us, you are in complete control. We trust in you. Our faith is in you. We wholly rely on you. We give you praise and glory this morning. In this house you have blessed us with as the church gathers together. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So just a couple of quick announcements, some very exciting things. Next, Now, before I get to next week, Lord willing, next weekend is the time change. Ugh. And it's not the good time change. It's the, it's the spring forward time change, which is nice in the evening, but then we none of us. So I'm going to be watching next week when people waltz in at 11 o'clock, and I will point you out from the platform. So that's your warning right now. If you're an hour late, I will point and laugh at you. So just keep that in mind for next weekend. Our capital project, praise the Lord, through the generosity of his people, has essentially been met. So Jurgen and I and uh, Angela and Carol Dean, we're going to be having offices up here very soon. Don't ask me what very soon is, but the Lord has provided. And we're going to have our offices up here very, very soon so you can come and bang on my window and tease me through there. Come and harass Jurgen all you want. You don't have to go all the way to the back of the building anymore. So praise God for that. Uh, Bible studies are going back to just Wednesday nights. We made an adjustment and had them also on Sunday to meet the demand. But now that we can meet at 30% of building capacity, we're just meeting in the fireside room, so we're back to just Wednesdays. If you haven't been coming out, I'd really encourage you to come out. We're, we're working our way very slowly through the book of Philippians. It's very much conversational style, a lot of, a lot of open dialogue. So, you know, if you're not able to or haven't been able to come out, I invite you to come out on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're supposed to be done by 8. That never happens. But it's a wonderful time to get together and study God's Word in a more intimate setting, to pray together. Uh, so I would just encourage you to so that. So there's no Bible study, no prayer meeting tonight. So we're going back to strictly on Wednesdays. Uh, I know I'm forgetting some announcements, Jurgen. Congregational meeting, thank you. There's a congregational meeting. It's in your bulletin. Uh, we have that Saturday, March 27th at, 20, uh, at 7 p.m., sorry, 2021. Um, so all members, uh, everyone's welcome to attend, but of course members of Glenridge will be voting on budgets and things like that, so that's coming up shortly. Uh, we'll have our ministry reports available to everybody in the congregation. So uh, that's coming up shortly. I'm trying to think if I have anything else. There's a wonderful coloring sheet. Bob, there's a coloring sheet in the insert, so help yourself. I don't have Jim here, so I'm going to give my dear friend Bob, who's got an awesome name, a hard time this morning. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite Angela to come up and just share a little bit about uh, Disciple Land and Children's Ministry going forward.
Well, hello, everyone. Hi, kids. It's so good to see all of you here today. Wonderful. I brought something to add to our table, but before I show you what I brought today, I had a couple of announcements. Lord willing, next Sunday, we will have a Disciple Land program running for you. Woohoo! Isn't that exciting? Yay! Well, there will also be a nursery and a preschool program in the old library that will be hopefully staffed next week. So if you are here this morning and you want some more information about that, uh, Mr. Derek and I will be at the registration table just through the double doors. I've got some information there. I have um, the volunteer schedule. So if you're a volunteer in our ministry programs and you want a hard copy of the schedule, come and see me. Or if you have questions, come and see me and I uh, will try to answer those questions for you. Okay? But now for what I've brought because we have been discussing the season of Lent and we've been walking with the Lord Jesus through some of the, I guess, the beginning stories of his ministry. And you remember our very first week, the very first Sunday in Lent, we brought the seashell. And that was for the story of Jesus being baptized. And we were reminded that Jesus was God's son and he came for a very, very special reason. And then next week, the week following, I brought my Bible and I left that on our table because we had the story of Jesus going into the wilderness. And he spent 40 days communing with his father. And he didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And at the end of that time, the tempter came to him. But Jesus answered all of those temptations with the word of God. And we discussed how important it is that we spend time with God and reading his word. And I challenged you to make that a special priority for you during our Lent season. Well, today, this is what I've brought. Maybe you don't know what this is. This is a big bandage. Now, how many of you love when you hurt yourself? I remember when I was about six years old, I was playing in the gym at school, and I slipped, and I fell, and I smashed my two front teeth right out. That was awesome. I loved that experience. It was the best. Don't you just love it, Jack, when you fall off your bike or something like that? Scrape your elbow. Isn't that great? No? That's not your favorite thing? What about when you fall out of a tree? Isn't that fantastic? I see a thumbs down. Not so fun? Oh, man. Oh, I know. What about this one? How about when you get a good case of the flu? Yeah. That's good times, isn't it? Oh, no? No. We do not like getting hurt. We do not like having to go to the doctor. We do not like being bandaged up, or having to take that yucky medicine. Even my dog doesn't like to take medicine. I had to give her some and hide it in cheese because otherwise she spits it out and stares at me. Like, what are you trying to do to me? And we don't like being hurt. We don't like being sick. And you know, I was thinking about that because when Jesus was ministering on earth and he was walking among all the people and going from town to town, people started to realize something about Jesus. Jesus could heal them of their sicknesses and their hurts. And he did heal many people. In fact, in the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus meets a man who has a disease called leprosy. Now, We've been talking a lot this past year about things like having to be self-isolated and not be with people. Well, here was a man who understood all about that. Because according to God's law, when he had leprosy, he wasn't allowed to be in the city with the people. He wasn't allowed to go to church. He had to be isolated away from everybody because he was so sick with leprosy. But something wonderful happened when he met the Lord Jesus. Jesus came and touched that man who had leprosy. And he said, I am willing for you 
to be made clean. And he healed that man of that horrible disease. <gasps> How wonderful. And the very next story is about a Roman centurion. We've talked about a centurion before. He was not well liked. He represented people who were treating the Jewish people unfairly with laws that they thought were wrong and probably were wrong. But here, this centurion came up to Jesus and he said, my servant is home and he's sick. If you could just say a word, he would be made well. And Jesus was astonished at this centurion's faith. And he said, it will be as you say. And Jesus just said a word. He didn't even see the sick man. And that man was made better. Wow. And then, very, very next story in that chapter, Jesus goes to Simon Peter's house, and his mother-in-law has a fever, and she's in bed. You have probably been in bed with a fever before, and it's not very fun. Jesus went up, and he took her by the hand, and she was made well. And then the Bible tells us at the end of that chapter that there were many people who were sick, and Jesus healed them all. And then Matthew quotes a verse from an old prophecy from Isaiah, where Isaiah had written about the suffering servant who was to be Jesus. And Isaiah wrote, he has borne our iniquity and healed our diseases. When I thought of those pictures of Jesus healing people, I thought, you know, that's exactly what it was. It was wonderful that Jesus healed their bodies. But that is a picture of what the more wonderful work was that Jesus was there to do. And it wasn't only to heal people's bodies, as wonderful as it was. That's only a picture of Jesus healing our sin-sick hearts. Because you know what? We might have sick bodies and we might get better again, but we'll probably get sick again. And then we might get better again, and then we'll probably get sick again. And even the people that Jesus brought back to life, like Lazarus, who actually died, and Jesus made him come alive again, guess what? Lazarus actually died again. Because our bodies are about this world, but our hearts and our souls are about eternity. You know, at your birthday, when you get a present, maybe you like Lego. I don't know. We like Lego at our house. And you open up your present, and you get a box, and it's Lego. Woohoo! That's exciting. And what's on the outside of that box? It's a picture. A picture of the Lego that's inside. But the picture on the outside of the box isn't as good as the Lego that's on the inside of the box, right? I mean, wouldn't you rather have the Lego inside of the box than the picture on the outside? Right? It's kind of like that with Jesus healing all of these people. That's the picture on the outside of the box. It's a picture that shows the power of God. The power of God to heal bodies, but the power of God to heal our sin-sick hearts and restore our relationship with God the Father so that one day we will all be with Jesus together. Our sin is forgiven, and we will be able to stand before a holy God. And Jesus will say, this person is covered in my righteousness, and I have forgiven them. Jesus had the power to forgive people of their sin. And to show that, he healed people on the outside so that they could see he was powerful and had the power and authority that God had given to him because of who he was. So kids, during our Lent season... Look for examples. Next time you hurt yourself and you get better, it's a picture. A picture of what Jesus wants to do in your heart. If you fall down and scrape your knee, you watch as your knee gets better slowly, slowly, slowly. It's a picture. A picture of what Jesus wants to do. He wants to forgive your heart. He wants to forgive you of sin. He wants you to become part of the family of God. And I'm going to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you care about 
our sicknesses and our diseases. And thank you for the examples of that, that Jesus healed people and he showed he cared about them. And thank you for the wonderful ways that we are healed of our many, many sicknesses and diseases that we can get even now. Thank you for the wonderful way you've made our bodies to heal themselves in so many ways. And thank you for doctors and medicines and the wonderful blessings that they can be for us, Lord. But more than all of that, we thank you for the ultimate healing of our sin-sick hearts that you offer freely to any who will believe in you. I pray for everyone here today. I pray especially for children. I pray, Lord Jesus, you would speak to their hearts and show them that they need their hearts to be healed, to be healed from sin and to be made whole by the power of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dean. Well, good morning, everyone. I like this. You know, usually when I'm preaching, Jurgen's in the back making faces at me. And it's, it's wonderful to see all your faces, even though some of you, I can only see half of your face. You got beautiful eyes. Now, we began... Uh, a series in the book of James, and we will continue that. But I thought with us getting back together in person for the first time since Christmas Eve. Who was here Christmas Eve? Yeah, I think I was here. Pretty sure I was here. Um, we had that nice, I guess you would call it a snowstorm, maybe-ish. It was nice to have snow for Christmas. It was wonderful to be outside, and the kids complaining as we took our annual Christmas Eve photos in front of Dad's light display. It's wonderful to hear their joyous complaints that it's cold and it's time to go in and drink hot chocolate and stuff. It seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it, since Christmas Eve? Well, don't worry, it's less than 300 days till next Christmas. So we're, you know, just hang in there. We're almost there. What I wanted to do this morning is I wanted to look at a very famous and significant statement made by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in Matthew chapter 16. And when, whenever the Lord asks a question... It's very important. It's very important. You take note of questions when they're asked in the Bible. It begins in verse 13 of Matthew, chapter 16. You find the account also in Luke 9. It's much more brief there. Here we get a fuller picture of what's happening. And beginning in verse 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, 
Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Take note of that. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they say, they said, some say John the Baptist, and some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That was the, the thought out there in public as to who Jesus was. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, and this is another incredible statement, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. And I just want to add verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. Our loving Father, we thank you again for your precious word. We ask your blessing on it this morning. We pray again that Jesus would be magnified, the Spirit of God would burn in our hearts, and we would be more like Christ when we leave this place. We pray, Jesus, come quickly. In Christ's name, amen. I want to do something a little bit different. I want to get a little interactive here, Awana style. We haven't had Awana in quite a while. Remember two weeks to flatten the curve? Well, we're celebrating the one-year anniversary of two weeks to flatten the curve. And so we haven't had a wand. It came to a very abrupt end. And I remember we had the Grand Prix was over on this side of the building. And I preached a message. I think it was on Samson or Goliath. I can't even remember. And that was the end of Awana. So I want to do something that I like to do at Awana and make this interactive. I want to ask you some questions. Don't be shy. You're amongst family. So if you're wrong, I'll just tease you a little bit and then we'll move on. Someone has said there are no bad questions. Yeah, there are. And there are no bad answers. Oh, sure there is. But that is not my purpose today. I want to think about great statements made in history. I'm going to give you the statement. And you're going to put up your hand if you know who said it. And I've got some great prizes for you. Come and see me Monday in the office. Monday's my day off. Listen. Listen closely. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberation, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Who said it? Wait, no, I want hands. I said, Jim. President Ronald Reagan, correct. You won nothing. Congratulations. Okay, here's another one. I'm starting with easy ones. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong, a little bit of history for you. He, it, he actually said, one small step for a man, one, small, one giant leap for mankind. The A didn't make it through the original recording from the moon. We only know it as one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Okay, here's another one. They're gonna get tougher. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. George Power, Winston Churchill, you are correct. Now you should get an award for that. Said that August 28th, 1942. Remember, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Who said that? Yes. Pardon me? Eleanor Roosevelt. Absolutely correct. All right, what about this one? The two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you, found, you find out why. Famous writer. Who said that? Thank you, Pastor Dave, you are correct. Mark Twain said that. And here's a good one. My favorite. 
Early bird gets the worm, but cookie tastes better than worm, so me sleep in. <laughs> Who is that, kids? Who was it? Cookie Monster, you're correct. He also said onion rings be vegetables. My mind was totally blown away when he said that. Onion rings be vegetables. I had to redefine my reality after I learned that. Well, after, after all these great impactful statements ever said by men and women throughout history, whether they were scripted or not, they all will pale in comparison to the red letters you'll find in your Bible today. Everything the Lord Jesus said had purpose, it had significance. The Lord Jesus and God never fills time with unimportant things. What I mean by that is every word that proceeds from the mouth of God has purpose and has significance. And that's especially true when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he says. For example, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It's believed that those are the first recorded words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first gospel written, the gospel of Mark. And that's important. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of the most impactful statements. And unlike the other men and women who shared a good thing at a good time, the Lord Jesus Christ was the perfect person who spoke the perfect words by the perfect man, the only perfect man who ever lived. Today's focus is the question he asks his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? You know, the eventual understanding of who Jesus is, his purpose in coming, is the foundation of the church. It is the cornerstone with the apostles' teaching forming the foundational doctrines of the church today. Everything the apostles' doctrine, everything that they taught, was taught to them by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and therefore has divine authority. Matthew's gospel is considered, of course, the ecclesiastical gospel. It's the royal gospel, the kingdom gospel. It connects the Lord Jesus Christ to the Davidic throne and the Davidic promises. It's so often used by preachers. I often don't preach from Matthew because so many preachers do preach from Matthew. But so many preachers preach and teach from Matthew because it arranges Jesus' ministry and teaching in five sections, give or, give or take. You have the Sermon on the Mount, the Messiah's messengers and the message, the Messiah's parables and his self-revelation. I wrote down here like in a map, we are here. This is where we are today. The Messiah's disciples and their behavior to one another. The Messiah's prophecy of his return, the great Olivet Discourse. We're in this section of self-revelation. Christ's revelation about who he is. We are now, in verse 13, walking on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's a Gentile town, thoroughly pagan, known for its worship of the nature god Pan. We are on the northern shore, pardon me, we are on the slopes of Mount Hermon, and there, carved out in the stone face, are all of the gods, the pagan gods. And the centerpiece of them all is Pan. It serves as a fitting backdrop for the question, with the pantheon of gods behind him carved out into the stone, the one true God and the Son asks the question, who do men say that I am? Who do people say that I am? It's somewhat of a peculiar question. He's never asked a question like this before recorded in the Gospels, specifically in this way. Who do men say that I am? And so since he asks this question, it's incredibly important that we pay attention because depending on how a person answers this question will determine their eternal destiny, whether you will spend eternity with God or apart from God. How you answer this question determines your eternal destiny. And there's only one correct answer. It's the first time, really, that Jesus is going to tackle the question of his divine origin 
and his identity in depth. He does so in verse 21 when he talks about how he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer from the elders and the scribes. That he must give his life. That he must be killed. And from this time forward, Jesus' teaching is focused on how he came to suffer and to die. And this was the polar opposite belief. The polar opposite of the preconceived ideas of who the Messiah was. Before all this, it says in Luke 9 that Jesus had gone away to pray. And this was always, this was always the case when the Lord Jesus was about to make a profound, uh, a, a, a profound revelation to his disciples. Before he selected the apostles, he went to pray. Here, before he, he gives this, this fuller revelation of his purpose, of his identity, of his coming to die for sinners, he goes to pray. He goes to seek the strengthening of his Father. And so as we see so often as Jesus does before a major move in his ministry, he goes off to pray. And that's when the disciples come along, according to Luke 9. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. Who do men say that I am? There were lots of opinions circulating. The disciples give the answers, well, well Lord, there, uh, some say that you're John the Baptist. And some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. That was the common thought, that Jesus was just another one in a long line of great prophets through the history of Israel. But after the period of, the, of silence for almost 400 years, God has now sent a new prophet. And Jesus is just simply a prophet. Somehow, he, you know, he's, one of the prophets has come back to life. But of course, those were not true. These were, these were false confessions. Today, if, if you ask somebody, who's Jesus? I dare you. Ask somebody that you know is not a believer, who's Jesus? If they don't outright dismiss the question entirely and gloss past you, they'll probably give you one of these types of answers, that he was a great Teacher, great moral teacher, a good man, the ideal human, a man of great righteousness, and he was martyred for his faith. He's just, just a great example of how to live, and to stand up for what we believe in. And some will take it a step further and actually acknowledge that he was a great prophet, but he was only a prophet, that he was just a man, some religious man. Truly, the words of the Apostle John echo when he said, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So Jesus asked the disciples as they approach him after his time of prayer, after his time of intimacy with the Father, great example for us. He asked them, Who do the crowds say that I, the Son of Man, am? He uses the most common title the Jews recognize as belonging to the Messiah. It was one of the titles of the Messiah, the Son of Man. But what's interesting is the Jews very rarely use that term. They almost exclusively refer to the Messiah as the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, that he's this charismatic deliverer of the people a military man, a political man, a mover and shaker in the religious world. That's probably why Jesus very rarely, if ever, used that title of himself. As a matter of fact, he has to be asked. And even in his answer, he does not directly use the title. He uses the term son of man about 84 times in the Gospels. And here he says, who do the crowd say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the disciples answered and gave those, those people, John the Baptist, that he'd somehow come back from the grave to continue his ministry of announcing the Messiah. That, of course, spooked Herod the Tetrarch, because he had him killed. Some say, well, he's Elijah, because he had been a great prophet. It was prophesied that he 
that's, that somebody would come along with the same spear, with the same fire that Elijah had. And then he would arrive before the Messiah come. Malachi 4 and 5 says, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you, or Elijah to you, before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And Malachi 3 and 1 was fulfilled in John the Baptist. Malachi 4 and 5 was partially fulfilled in John the Baptist as well. There's a fuller, fuller fulfillment to that prophecy coming when the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, a dreadful and terrifying day of judgment. But John the Baptist, the Baptist has already come. The forerunner has already come. He's already announced that the kingdom of God is at hand. He announces that there's time to repent, that the Messiah is coming. So he's not Elijah, or pardon me, he's not John the Baptist. He's not, not Elijah. Some say, well, you know what? He's Jeremiah. And he is, at least for me, my favorite Old Testament prophet. A sorrowful man. Lamenting the spiritual condition and then the physical condition of Jerusalem, of Israel. There are some extra biblical sources that said Jeremiah, of course, the Bible never records his death, so according to Jewish superstition, he never died. And that he had actually taken the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense out of the temple, and he hid them. He hid them. And just before the Messiah returned, Jeremiah would return to the earth and reestablish temple worship. He would bring the Ark of the Covenant back to the temple and the altar back to the temple. As I said, they considered him immortal because his death isn't mentioned in Scripture, just like Elijah. He didn't die. was directly taken to heaven. Lots of superstitions, lots of different thoughts, lots of different assumptions and preconceived ideas of who Jesus is. None of these answers are correct, of course. So after all the answers of who the people thought Jesus was, after he takes a poll of what society at large thinks of him, he asks a very specific question. I can't help but imagine in my mind as he stands at the slopes of Mount Hermon with the carved out images of the false gods, with those apostles, the disciples closest to him, who have witnessed his miracles, witnessed the feeding of the 5,000, witnessed him walking on water, witnessed all these incredible, incredible di displays of his divine nature. He then asks them a question that he's still asking people today. And as I said, how you answer this question will determine your eternal destiny. Who do you say that I am? I can almost picture Jesus looking at each of the apostles in their eyes as he said, Who do you say that I am? Lots of opinions of who Jesus is. Only one truth. Not your truth. Not my truth. That's one of those little Marxisms and Proverbs of today. Speak your truth as, it's, as somehow it's subjective. Truth is objective. And so what's the truth? So Simon Peter, of course, as the spokesman, pipes up and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the confession. What Peter just said here, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the confession that saves a person's soul. Very simple and convicting. This is the heart of the gospel. The identity of Christ is at the center of the gospel because if Jesus Christ is not who he said he is, we are gathered here in vain. And we're actually, the Bible says, pathetic and pitiful people because our hope's in a dead man who is a liar. But it says very clearly in the scriptures that he was raised from the dead. The things that Jesus said, the things that Jesus did, testified that he is God of very God. And so Simon Peter answers the question, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Without hesitation, 
Peter is moved to declare that Jesus is the long-awaited deliverer of Israel, the supreme anointed one, prophet, priest, king, savior. Christ, the Greek equivalent of a Messiah, the Messiah. He is the son of God. He's the same substance, same character, same essence, same being as God the Father. He is the son of the living God. He is the source of life. He is the power of all, and all the power of life lies in him. Literally what Peter was saying, and this is why I read it when we read the scripture text, is that in the Greek there's a series of definitive articles. That's why I read it the way I read it, because really in the Greek, the understanding is when Peter says this, he says, you are the Christ. The Son of the living God. The question is, As Peter answers that question, the question I have for you is, do you know that Jesus is the Son, the Christ of the living God? Because how you answer that question will determine your eternity. It wasn't enough that the disciples witnessed those amazing miracles. It wasn't enough that they saw the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 and Jesus walked on the sea and how many came to touch his garment to be healed and so on and how how he healed a withered withered hand on the Sabbath and he performed all these miracles and, and taught as no man ever had. All those miracles, all those teachings, all that wasn't enough to convince the thousands that witnessed it. Even the disciples themselves were struggling with the identity of Jesus. Because he looked like them, he smelled like them, he ate like them, he drank like them. But he never sinned. And so they struggled with the reality of the man standing before them with weathered hands, olive skin, dark hair, dark beard, cracked feet, sweating under the sun of the day, that this is God in the flesh. And they struggled with that. Despite everything they saw. Our abilities to understand the things of God in the flesh cannot happen. We cannot understand spiritual things apart from God revealing them. He is the one who brings understanding to our minds. Only God can do that. Paul says in the epistles, the natural man does not understand the things of God. It is in God's good love and favor and grace that he gives us understanding, that he gives us an understanding of who Jesus is. He is the one who reveals to us who Christ is. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus didn't say to Peter, you know what, Peter? You're a smart guy. I'm glad you finally got it. Because all you had to do was look at all the, all the miracles I performed, the feeding of the 5,000 men, plus their families, plus their kids. We're talking like 12,000 people. And not only that, but there were great blessings. The blessings overflowed, and we had all these baskets of food extra. Not, you know what, Peter? You saw me walking on water. I defied natural law by walking on water. Never mind these false uh, theories that Jesus was walking on a sandbar. That's trash and rubbish and garbage and the thoughts of the natural man. He walked on water and defied nature. He was able to take a man's withered hand on the Sabbath because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And is able to define the Sabbath and give understanding about the significance of the Sabbath and heal the withered man's hand. And cures a woman with a blood flow. Raises Lazarus from the dead, the widow of Nain's son from the dead. Awesome, Peter, you figured it out in your own flesh and mind. You're a really smart guy. He never said that. I knew Jesus... Now I know Jesus. There's a difference. One was in my own understanding of who Jesus is, and one is the revelation and the understanding that God gives of who Jesus is. Which do you have? One you know of him. One he is a good moral teacher. He's a little baby in the manger. Rumors are he died on the cross. Some people believe that he was raised from the dead, but that's rubbish because dead people don't come back from the dead. And one is, he is my savior, he is my king, he is my Lord. That comes from divine knowledge. Peter didn't have a master's degree in spirituality to figure that out. And neither do I. That takes a work of God. 
And that's what Jesus says here, that God the Father gave Peter understanding, opened his mind, revealed to him exactly who Jesus is. That he's not just a prophet. He's not just a good moral man. He's not the forerunner. He's not any of these things. He's not a miracle worker or just simply a rabbi. That term falls so woefully short of who Jesus is. That he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You can only have that knowledge as God gives you grace. I hope you know that today. Because how you answer this question will determine your eternal destiny when you die. And then Jesus says something that theologians love to wrestle over. Blessed are you, Simon and Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven... And I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. The natural question is, what rock is Jesus talking about? Remember where they are. Mount Hermon. The slopes of a great pagan idol worship center. That was the setting when he says this upon this rock. So what is the rock? Why did everyone else believe that Jesus was just a prophet? Why did everyone else lack understanding? Because they did not have a revelation from God, but Peter did. And Peter's name here literally means small stone. That's what it means from the word Petros in the Greek. Many of you are familiar with that. That Peter's name literally means small stone. It's the masculine form of the Greek word Petros. But the word that Jesus uses to describe the rock upon which he will build his church is Petra. Petra. So he says small stone, mountaintop. That's the difference between the words. It's the same word essentially, but the imagery that Jesus uses when he says, upon this rock I will build my church, isn't a small stone. It's not built upon Peter himself, as some would believe. Jesus is masterfully using wordplay, as he often does, and sometimes it's lost in the English. But its meaning, its significance is still there. He's speaking to the small stone, to Petros, to Peter, and saying, upon this rock, on this Petra, I will build my church. Peter, the small stone, by the grace, by the revelation of God in his mind, has made this incredibly powerful statement about the identity of Jesus. Who do you say that I am? You are the Son, the Christ of the living God. And many have interpreted the statement itself to be the large rock upon which the church is founded upon, the identity of who Jesus is. How it was divinely revealed, that revelation directly relates to our salvation. As I said, the core preaching of the gospel is who Jesus is, his person, and the extension of that, his work, Because his person gives his work eternal significance. But there's more, really. The the rock, this this Petra, this rock that Jesus is going to build his church, is really the whole of the apostolic band's teaching. It's the whole of the apostles' doctrine. Because this statement will begin the apostles into the the masters, the, the doctorate training of what we have as the basic foundation of our church today, our church doctrine. It is founded upon the apostles' doctrine. That is why the church in the first century devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because they were first taught by Christ himself. 
And they were entrusted with that message and with that teaching and as God gave them further understanding and further revelation through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, they recorded for us in the New Testament today. That rock upon which this statement is, or the, 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 his church is going to be built upon, is initially this statement about the identity of Jesus who is the cornerstone of the church and the foundation is the apostles' doctrine. And Jesus says, upon this truth, and upon the further teaching of the apostles, which I will give them and will be empowered with the, with the authority of the Holy Spirit, upon this rock I will build my church. We are here 2,000 years later, and we still have those words in our hands today. This is the rock. So get to know it. And Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. Who builds it? Doesn't say Peter's going to build it. Doesn't say Simon or Andrew or Bartholomew or any of the other apostles that don't get a sound bite. Doesn't say Bobby's going to build it. Doesn't say any of those things. He says, I will build my church. That's exactly what Jesus is doing today. He began this construction project back 2,000 years ago. And Jesus is still working on it today. He is building his church. Without this confession, without this revelation, without this being our doctrine upon which we stand, the identity of Christ, his person, his purpose, his work, without that, we're no different than the social clubs of the world. We might as well just put out pool tables and dartboards and turn that coffee room into something else because we're no different than all of those other social clubs. I wrote in my devotion this last week, which I think you'll be getting shortly. This isn't, uh, and I'm part Ukrainian, so I can say this. This isn't the Ukrainian club. Great cabbage rolls, by the way. This isn't the Ukrainian club. This isn't the Polish club. This isn't the well and gun club. That's not who we are. We're the church. We're the church. Built upon this statement is Christ who will call, Christ who will convict, Christ who will baptize by his spirit, all those who are his. He will do the work. No matter how oppressive, no matter how hopeless it may seem at times, even in times like this, where we're allowed to Meet together and not meet together and then meet together and not meet together and then rumors that, you know, just down the road, we won't be allowed to meet together. Despite all that's happening in the world today, despite all of that, no matter your opinion of it, Christ is still at work. God is still calling people to his son and his spirit is still moving. His word is still being preached and will continue to be because Christ is doing the work. No schemes of man or the devil will ever stop that, ever. The church is still under construction. Never mind our offices that will be built up here, Lord willing. That's not the church. That's just a place where I put my books. I have my desk. And you're going to keep our transformer collection. It's just a building. It's just a building. It's a beautiful building and we're so blessed to have this building. We're blessed to have the school downstairs. We're blessed to have this sanctuary. We're blessed to have this gym. We're so blessed. But our blessings go beyond this because there's a day coming where the church will not be here as I'm reading Isaiah chapter 24 and the joy that we'll have because we'll be gone and this building will just fall and crumble apart because there's not going to be anyone here to take care of it. We're the church. And the Lord Jesus Christ is still working on it. It's still under construction. A few more blocks to carve out in the quarry for the heavenly tabernacle. And when it pleases the Father, eventually this project will come to a close. And upon that rock, the church will be built. And it will be completed. The project will be fulfilled. The age of grace will come to an end. And then the dark time. And then the judgment. And I shudder. 
as I read through the book of Isaiah, especially as you get to chapter 24. I was almost in tears last night reading. And Isaiah himself was shocked. Woe to me, he says. He couldn't even bring himself to rejoice in the remnant that remained. He was just so broken over the judgment that waits those who do not answer the question. When Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And you do not answer the question with you are the Christ. Eventually this project will come to a close and and unlike other projects, this one will be right on time and under budget. And that's going to be a glorious day. So as far as great historical sayings go, as wonderful as what Churchill said and Twain said and Roosevelt said and even Cookie Monster said, all very profound things said by great people at great times in history, Jesus, the only perfect person who spoke the perfect word in the perfect time, asks you a question today. Who do you Say that I am. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord God, we thank you again for this chance, this opportunity really to be together according to your will. To gather around your word, to worship you, to study it, to hear again the words of our precious Savior, who do you say that I am? There are so many that have so many thoughts, many different ideas over who Jesus is. And we thank you for the profound divinely inspired statement of the Apostle Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We thank you that you have revealed that to us and given us understanding and saved us and called us unto your Son. We thank you, holy God, that we are your children, that we are the church of Jesus. Here today, 2,000 years later, the Lord is still at work, laboring this great work of love saving sinners like us. So we give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. We praise you, Lord God, giving you thanks for all that we've been blessed with and all that awaits us in glory as we have eternal life here and now. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. take my glasses off because I only need them really for reading so I couldn't see all of you. So now I can see you so maybe I should put my glasses back on. Uh, I just want to tell you I love you guys. I really love you a lot and uh, I'm just so pleased and so so blessed to have you here this morning. I think my kids are a little tired of having me around all the time especially on Sunday mornings. Uh, so it's so wonderful to have you all here. And uh, 
I really challenge you to be a blessing to others when the opportunity comes. Let's pray. But stand as we pray, if you're able to, please. Loving God, Holy Father, we just thank you again for your wonderful love to us. We are truly so blessed in the heavenly places. We are blessed here on the earth. And it's just a blessing to be your people. Father, we acknowledge our own sinfulness, our own waywardness, how we are prone to wander, how we are just so prone to forget the mercies and the grace that we enjoy in Christ. We are so quick to dismiss the word of God. Lord, we pray again that your spirit would just burn in us, that there would be a personal revival in our own lives and in the life of the church today. When it seems we have such difficulty getting traction, we're reminded that Christ is building his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So we take great comfort in that. Lord, we thank you for this church family. We thank you for this building, the many blessings that we enjoy. And Father, we pray for those who are suffering at this time, whether it be physical, financial, spiritual, mental, whatever avenue the suffering is, we pray again your blessing, your deliverance, your comfort, Lord, we just pray again that people would sense your great love. We're reminded of that by Jesus on the cross for us. And so we are just, again, in awe, Holy Father, that we have such a salvation in Jesus. Lord, I pray now for this congregation that your face would shine upon them. They would sense your peace, that you would take us home in peace and protect your people until the end come. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed. Love you.